Hi, and welcome to the ECM Podcast. I'm Friedrich Kunzmann, and I'm excited to be hosting this newest episode of the podcast and take you behind the scenes of new music on ECM Records. In this episode, I'm joined by the British pianist and composer Kit Downs, whose third album for ECM, Vermilion, was released in February 2022. Vermilion was recorded in Lugano in the summer of 221 and was produced by Manfred Eicher. On the new record, Kid introduces us to his exceptional pianistic qualities in a trio context, in collaboration with the Danish bass player Peter Eld and British drummer James Madrin. After the organ-based debut Obsidian and his chamber-toned ensemble work Dream Life of Debris, Vermilion yet again takes us to a different part of Kit's musical imagination, replete with subtle twists and turns as Kit and his trio offer a highly individual take on the piano trio format. Kit, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. I'd love to get started by trying to put this new record of yours into context with your last two ECM outings. Mm -hmm. You're shifting the format again, and you introduce us to your trio partners, Peter Eld and James Madrin. Mm -hmm. Can you put this record into context with the last ones? Do they have anything in common with each other musically? Or what are their differences, apart from the obvious changes in instrumentation and collaborators? Yeah, I, I think all the all the changes between the records are all defined by um, who's involved first. So I think that's kind of key, like who I'm writing for. Uh, that sort of dictates the aesthetic and the flow, and many different decisions are dictated to by by who I want to play with, basically, for that project of course so for the first one it was just me obviously um and that was more about my own that was more about revisiting a thing from my youth of just traveling around playing different organs in my in the area where i'm from uh, so it was a bit of a nostalgia trip but it was also me stretching myself trying to make a whole record of soda organ which i hadn't done before i'd only done collaborative things up until that point and then the second record was me trying to stretch myself in terms of trying to put the organ in a broader context. So to make it part of an ensemble, which is organ isn't usually a an ensemble instrument. I mean, other than with choirs um, and sometimes with orchestra, but not, not very often. It, it's usually quite a lonely gig. <laughs> in a way yeah um and especially not with instruments like electric guitar or cello or saxophone things like this piano as well and the part of the game of that record was to try and play with the perspective in such a way that you could see organ sitting sonically alongside these other instruments that are of a very a much smaller scale in a way and to try and create an illusion in a way of um of the idea that these instruments could all feel as big as each other in different moments in the music and move in and out uh, as equals in terms of their sonic capacity, which is not true. If you sit in a room and play an organ at the same time as a cello, there'll be a usually be a, a pretty clear winner out of those two if you're playing at a sort of average volume. And also it becomes very roomy and you lose a lot of details. So the second record in that way was really... Um, was really almost like a sort of audiophile experiment for myself to try and play with uh, instruments that don't normally record together and to do it in a way that's very close mic and very detailed rather than just putting a stereo pair at the back of a room and trying to make our levels work in the in the room and then the third record um especially because I knew it's going to be with Manfred so we weren't going to have all of that editing post-production options because it's done the way that he does it which is two days recording one day mix and that happened at a point where I was really up for that as well actually because we'd had these two records where there was well the first record is all live but the second record was very edited and e even to the point where that's how the compositions grew really was through the editing so then the third record was all live takes 
no headphones, no separation, um, no edits or anything like that. It's a very purist kind of record in that way. And you capture a lot of the sound of the room. Um, it's very live in that way. And that, that was quite a nice refreshing change from the, the one before. So I, I guess it, the answer is that it, it's linked just by where the last record left me in terms of my interests and what I was interested in pursuing in terms of process. Once I had achieved that idea that I wanted to do in the first record, it led me somewhere else to the second one. And again, once I'd done that with the second record, it led me into somewhere else that I wanted to try uh, with the third. So it, it sort of connects the dots by how not opposing they are, but how... Um, one approach basically triggered the next one. Yeah, they just all scratch different itches, I guess, to put it not very eloquently. But. And you've been playing with Peter Eld and James for a while now. James and you go way back to your college days. And you've been playing with Peter for a long while in various projects too. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about your collaborators a bit more? Sure. J James, as you said, I've played with since college. So I've known him for a long time. We lived together. We used to practice together. And we've always had a band together since we met. So I can't really imagine anyone else playing drums in my band um, or in our band because we grew up learning together. So I think we even influenced how we ended up playing just by virtue of spending so much time playing together and and practicing together. So he feels very part of the language that I want to explore. Um. I sort of rushed through that because it's such a constant in my musical life, James, in a way. so <laughs> he's, he's implied, um, in a way. Yeah, it's it, almost in my head, although I don't take it for granted, but it, it's just, um, I can't imagine not ever playing with him, so that's sort of how it is. Uh, then Petter, I met a bit later through seeing Django Bates play, and I was struck by how, um, how free the music felt that he played, but also how... Um, complex it was and I love that idea that something complex can can make you more free at the end of it than less because although there are there are more hoops to jump through it also requires a purer and a quicker response because the stress is on and you have to go with what you have at that moment and if you have the spirit of just letting things be what they are in that moment in the music then you can kind of navigate it in a in a free way, which he does. And it's because he also he has great trust in his own ability to be able to do that. And also both of them bring out good things in me. <laughs> that they both have kind of, the way they interact together is quite high energy. And you talk a lot about Peter Eld's uh, competence and abilities as a free improviser, giving you counterpoint on that end. What are James' qualities that you uh, cherish well, J James has got this incredible drum technique where he can play everything that he can play loudly. He can play it very quietly as well. So he can be just incredibly intense and detailed and and very um, full, but at a very low volume. And he plays with those dynamics all the time. So he plays loud as well, obviously. Um, and that technical control means that he can just articulate any idea he has at any point. <laughs> and he also has, it's like Petter, he has a very fluent natural ability at getting through complex rhythmic material. So when you get them two together, it just becomes very playful very quickly. But there's also, like both of them are a little bit stubborn as well, and uh, as am I. And I think that's, but also open. And that's a really nice thing that we've found, I think, together is that we both are happy, to, all three of us are happy to kind of hold our own and and play against each other sometimes, but also play with each other's ideas uh, when the time is right for the music as well. So it feels quite free in that way that we can all disagree and agree in the music when we feel like it. Again, it facilitates real choice in the music. When you know where someone stands with what they're playing and w what they're doing at that point, it actually gives you a choice, a proper choice to like go with them or not. or it, people don't get stuck in their roles like bass player has to play on the damn beat every bar and yeah, lay, the, sure. lay the chords really obviously and James has to keep time and you know these roles can evaporate then because it becomes more of a discussion a more equal discussion
So I feel like one could also say that because each of you is stubborn, but simultaneously open for musical adventure, there forcibly has to arise a sort of compromise that leads to a very pure form of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the compromise is informed, though. That's what's really nice about it. It's like everyone knows where each other, what each other think about things, and then um, where you end up compromising feels real rather than, I don't know, unequal in some way. I think that's quite hard to get in a trio as well, because it's... You always have this balance of two against one in some way. But I think we're really trying to cultivate like <laughs> one, uh, all for one and one for all. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like a kind of, um, you know, one on one on one. I mean, obviously th- things um, congeal together, especially in terms of harmony. That's obviously me and Petter's realm and with some rhythmic displacement stuff, for example, that's more James and Petter, but... So, but the fact that everyone is aware of that, like James has good harmony. He he knows what's happening in the music harmonically all the time. So he's part of that discussion, even if he can't offer a harmonic response to it. He knows, he knows where that cadence would be leading, for example, and he knows how to play into that or against it or support that idea or undermine it or ignore it or acknowledge Absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> all of those things. And not every drummer is harmonically informed that way. No, no. And not every bass player is as rhythmically informed as Petter is, you know. Yeah, and that's something that's also reflected in the credits on this album. Um, I mean, Petter basically writes half of the music, um, which leads me to ask the question, was the music on the album written explicitly for this trio, with this trio in mind, and specifically for this album? Can you talk about the compositions a bit? Yeah, I mean, the music was written for the trio. Um, this record had a bit of a long story because we, we were meant to record it about th- four years ago. By that point that we um, were in Lugano, uh, we had so much music ready because we'd been ready to record for about three years. And um, it all the music we had had gone through different stages as well. <laughs> there was There was like quite a lot of very dense, very rhythmically intense, quite shouty music. And then as we'd been gigging live, we'd started to explore timbre and chamber techniques a little more and um, try um, not everything being loud and fast, basically. And then so we started to write music that um, was representative of that and and then trying to find a middle ground between the two. And we brought all of that to the studio and then we just used what Manfred liked. And the music was always half Petter's, half mine, I think when we started the band, it was sort of more my idea. And then the more that we played each other's music, the the closer they managed to fit together in the end. And now, now it sort of feels like a collaborative band in that way, I guess. We're still waiting on James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We're waiting for James's uh, first blues suite. Now, if I remember correctly, when we talked before, a couple weeks back, you'd mentioned that the piece Class Fails was brought in only days before you recorded it. No, it was brought in on the day. Oh, on the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, on the first day of recording, which was half a rehearsal day, basically. But we, yeah, we um, he brought it in and we went through it for about 15 minutes and then recorded the take. But that's an interesting example, actually, because that... Um, that tune is complicated. It's, it's like goes from 11 to 7 to 3, blah, blah, blah. And the way we would have played that on the first record would be with beats and to spell out how hard that is, <laughs> in a way, and to play into the corners of the music, um, into the rhythmic corners of it and make them quite obvious. Whereas the way we dealt with it this time, it's still hard, but the aesthetic of it almost sounded like it was rubato in a way because of the way we didn't explicitly state the subdivisions of the 11 and the 7 and things like that. It wasn't, we weren't trying to highlight that in a way. It was just part of the fabric of it. Like you said, it turns into this rubato feeling. Uh, the first time I heard it, it, it just sounds completely natural, the way the rhythm unfolds, but not in a, in a constructed way, just organically. Mm. But the irony being that none of it is rubato, it's all very precise. <laughs> but I think that that was kind of a nice 
I mean, like I was talking earlier about how th- what I liked about Petra and what I wanted to capture in the band in the first place was this feeling that you could be more free when it's harder somehow. And that the idea with that tune is that uh, it's an extension of that idea in a way that you could be, you could even become more relaxed and play in a softer, even more melodic, easy, easy way on something that's very, very difficult. And that there's some there's some contrarian part of my brain that likes that idea that you don't play into what the, what the the usual tropes of what those things mean. Um, in terms of when you see something that's fast, you have to play a lot of notes, or when you see something that's hard, you have to fill in the subdivisions or whatever. You know, the, the, these kind of common uh, twin rules that are attached to aesthetics that way. I think it's kind of fun to subvert that a lot. I think the same thing, that same idea of not playing into the typical or common things is something that you do with the the last song on the record, Jimi Hendrix, Castles Made of Sand. You don't just repeat the melody of the verse, the melody of the of the chorus, but you you go somewhere else with the material and you deconstruct it. That's all quite written, that, that one. And I, it was because I wanted to... I love that song. I listened to that since I was a kid. But I also didn't want to just play it as a cover. That felt kind of weird too. And I also like this thing of arranging tunes where you just take bits of the DNA out of and then grow it up as a new entity from slightly altered DNA so it can look completely different to the original thing, but it's still got some of the same bones in it. And I think I wanted a, I wanted an arrangement like that on the record somewhere, especially with a tune like that. And um, so it was just about grabbing bits of melodic material or bits of the guitar riff or uh, rhythmic things um, from it and then trying to use that to just make a new piece, basically. This was the first time you recorded at the Auditorio Stelio Molo in Lugano with its pristine acoustics. Mm -hmm. How did the room impact your music? Well, James can't play loud in that room at all because it's boomy. Um, So, I mean, it, it nearly rules out playing with sticks for most tunes, which is a huge thing for him to deal with and we're just lucky that we have a drummer that can play with detail at a low volume you know? um but 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 then what you can do is push everything in the mix very close up so you get a lot of detail in the sand uh, because it's recorded at a lower level a lower volume so that's nice but it, yeah i mean we didn't have headphones either so we had to be able to hear everything in the room we were, we were playing like a string quartet basically would but with drums, so it, it, that's hard in a way. <laughs> it was quite. It, it it was very clear very quickly when we got in, what tunes were going to work and what and what wouldn't in a way. And we, you know, we could have like, I don't know, tried to hold whatever ground we thought we were trying to hold, and be like, no, we'll do them anyway, and we'll make it work, and or or we or we could just play to the room's strengths in a way. I mean. The room had such a, a particular sound and way to play in it that it felt like another player. Basically, it was like the fourth member of the band that had to be considered. You couldn't just ignore them and do what you would normally do if they weren't playing with you. Um, I mean, in the same way, it, it's similar to how... You, I mean, it's an extension of working with ECM. They have an aesthetic that they like and they have a they have a history of that aesthetic and you collaborate with ECM when you make a record for them you don't make your own record and then they put it out you you work together and find in a way this common ground that we were talking about earlier where where everyone sort of gets to do their own thing enough yeah and 
In the past, Kit, you've dedicated several concerts to pianist John Taylor, another musician who recorded extensively with ECM, and who you just mentioned earlier. You even dedicated your ECM debut, Obsidian, to him. Could you talk about your relation to him and the impact he's had on you as a composer? And would you say that figures in the music on, on Vermilion? Yeah, I mean, I loved him very much. I think he's amazing. Um, he was he was kind of the first uh, sort of person to support me when I was coming out of college and things. And he would listen to things and write me little supportive emails and things like that. That's how I got to know him. And I'd been listening to him since well before then. I'd been listening to the Peter Erskine records and um, Rosalind and uh, things with Kenny Wheeler and things like that. And then, you know, getting to meet this guy who was on those records was a big deal for me. And then for him to be as friendly and supportive as he was, was an even bigger deal because I just sort of assumed he'd be too busy to give a to give too much of a worry about um, a young piano student. And But that wasn't the case. He was really supportive to, to everyone in the scene. Um, So he was very generous and, you know, I got a lot of confidence from him being nice about my music early on. Um, and in terms of him as a, a player, I mean, yeah, he was just, uh, again, he was very generous in the way that he played. He he just wanted to create things in them. He just wanted to create events and take risks and take chances and newness. He was just interested in, in newness, basically. He wanted to be pushed somewhere different each time he played. And um, I think he just had a restless imagination. He always wanted to find a different way of doing something every time. He would always put himself in vulnerable musical positions to see what would happen. And something about that just feels so... Um, oh, it feels amazing to me that someone's like that, that's fearless in a way, musically. Just to... Uh, It's, it feels like a real devotion to music in that way, not not a devotion to how you appear to other people or, or even how you sound, but a devotion to the kind of thing of jumping off the cliff and seeing where you end up and letting letting the sea take you where it wants to take you and just trusting that it will be fine. There's something so powerful about how that resonates. That And I it was... Um, completely there in the way that I heard his music as well. The way that I heard him play, you could hear that spirit very strongly. But I miss hearing someone just ripping it up all the time, just <laughs> just happy to see what happens and not caring if there's a mistake either. Just that doesn't matter as long as it's interesting and as long as people are connected and listening and playing for each other. And that seemed to be all all that was important to him. And this idea of jumping off of a cliff and not caring about making mistakes, you've said that that's something that inspires you and, and drives you, and maybe that's something that we can also hear on Vermilion. Yeah, I try. I, mean, it's, um, it's, I think that's a bit of a life's work, that sort of cult, trying to cultivate that mindset of, uh, of letting things happen how they're going to happen, but... Um, I think it's a good sort of mantra musically to live by because you end up making things you would never expect to make if you do that. You're open to things all the time. But yeah, I um, well, and Petter and James are very much like that too. They just they want to see what's going to happen when you I don't know, throw a grenade in a chocolate factory or whatever. They just want to see how it pans out. <laughs> it's a kind of curiosity. And also they just have such a reliance in their own skill set that they can they can afford to be playful at that level of complexity. So, But that doesn't need to be about complexity, that discussion. That's just one way of doing it. That's just one side of it, I think. I mean, you can be very bold and take big risks in things that are not necessarily having a chance of going wrong per se, but more in your choices of, I don't know, it could be anything like who you work with or what instrument you work on or what type of music you draw on or what piece you cover or 
um, what lineup you pick. I mean, th these can all be interesting choices if you arrive there through an interesting route. <laughs> Um, so what you're saying is it's pretty much already a big risk to pick James and Petter to make music with. Ab absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But a beautiful risk, one that I like, you know. For me, that's like a very acceptable, enjoyable risk for me. And that music is like a nice, music is a nice outlet for risk for me because it's, you know, risk in real life can be quite terrifying, but... In music, ostensibly, no one really gets hurt, you know, and you can afford to like really practice that idea of being present and accepting, blah blah blah, those high ideals that that we strive for. But I mean, music is such a great playground for that. Okay, how about we uh, conclude by talking about what it was like to record this new material with Manfred Eicher? Um, it was cool. I mean, he had, um, I think he had an idea of what he wanted the record to sound like pretty quickly from hearing us play. And, um, I think he knew which pieces were going to work within five seconds of us playing them each. And it was usually about sound. It was usually about what piece fitted the room sound the best. It was a nice experience. You know, it's very relaxed and very quick as well. It all got... The whole record got made basically in a day. We recorded everything in one day, pretty much. And then did did uh, the sort of mixing on the second day, really. I mean, the second half of the second day. So it was very quick, very fluent. It was just about getting everyone in a good headspace and uh, and then going for it, which he's, very, he's good at that. He's good at getting people in the right positive mindset. You know? That was Kit Downs, talking about his new album, Vermilion, out on ECM Records. Thank you for joining me in the ECM podcast. I'm Friedrich Kunzmann, and I look forward to sharing more new music with you very soon.